commonly come across once using Jehovah's um, name freely. It's, Yahweh it's is more accurate. Yahweh would be more accurate, but I'm 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 happy with either term. Well, um, the introduction to chapter thirty-three. I'd like to read that but before I do. I don't believe anyone can become Jehovah's friend today. I don't believe it's possible. Okay. Okay. The only category that Jehovah has are adopted children of God, sons and daughters of God. Well, the phrase daughters of God actually I don't think is, is in the Bible. Sons of God, meaning men and women or children of God by adoption, people who've come into the new covenant. The term friend of God was used of people in the Old Testament, like Abraham, yeah. who died in his sins. But unlike wicked people like Ahab and Jezebel, Abraham died trusting in the Messiah who was to come. So when Christ rose from the grave, his righteousness was imputed to Abraham, Abraham's sins were imputed to Christ, and Abraham ceased being a friend of God at Christ's resurrection. He then came into a much closer relationship as a son of God by adoption. So, absolutely spot on. So Abraham's the only one referred to in the Bible as being God's friend. Yeah. My friend Abraham did me. However, the Bible has, for instance, Psalms 25, 14, does talk well, about... No, that's... that's you, haven't, you haven't listened. I'll read it. But Psalm 25 is a thousand years before Christ's death, burial and resurrection. Yeah. After Christ's death, burial and resurrection... I want you to show me a New Testament verse where people come to faith in Jehovah or in Jesus, not as sons of God, but as friends of God. Okay. Okay, I'll just read it. Jehovah wants you to know him better. Why? He hopes that the more you, you learn about his personality, his ways and his purpose, the more you will want to be his friend. Can you really be God's friend? Psalm 25, 14. What can you do to become his friend? The Bible answers those questions and reveals why friendship with Jehovah is the most important relationship you can have. Now again, where in the New Testament, after Christ's death, burial and resurrection, do we find people coming to faith in the New Testament period as friends of God, not as sons or daughters of God or children of God by adoption? So that term is not used in New Testament. In fact, the word... In fact, the word friend is not used. Can I just grab the door? Sorry, Robert. Yeah. That's right. I see. <laughs> Where were we? Oh, yeah. So the word friend is not used in that connection in the New Testament at all. However, can you not be a son of God in New Covenant, etc., these other relationships, and also be a friend? No, no. Um, the term friend of God is used in the New Testament once. It's used, however, in a past tense of Abraham, uh, yeah. James chapter 2, verse 23. There is no, there is no verse the relationship that God has now is with his children, with adopted sons of God. The term friend of God is, is not used. Now, it's used in Jehovah's Witness theology, I think, because you've got to, if, if you believe the people are going to heaven, the 144,000 who go to heaven are sons of God, children of God by adoption in the new covenant. And you believe that the ones who are resurrected to the earth have no covenant You've got to call them something. So I think they've scraped around and looked at the bottom of the barrel and they found this phrase, friend of God. So they said, ah, well, we'll call the ones who go to heaven children of God and we'll call the ones who live on the earth friend of God. That's what why is, they adopted that, I think. What is a friend, Robert? How do you describe a friend? People who are part of God's family have a closer relationship than a friend. There are no friends of God to date. Now, if I'm wrong, show me it from the Bible. Okay. 
because I have gone round and round and round and round and round for hours with Mormons and Christadelphians and Seventh Day Adventists and the worst of the bunch, the born again, spirit filled, tongue talking Pentecostals. They can talk and talk and sure, talk for hours, <laughs> and they will never show you any Bible verse. But they'll say, "Well, I reason here, and I reason here, and if that, then that, and if this, then that, and if that." And and three hours later, they're still talking and they're still reasoning. They don't ever show it to you from the Bible. They just talk and talk and talk like salesmen who just won't give up. Okay. Well, we hope. And you need to show it from the Bible. So, so you, as you already know, the term friend is not used frequently in the Bible. Abraham's the only one referred to as a friend. However, isn't a friend someone who's there for you, who has common interests, who shows love for you, is there to support you? So, in what way? Is Jehovah neither a friend to ones who serve him or the ones who serve him showing a friendship toward him? It's irrelevant, irrelevant. People in the new covenant are children of God by adoption. It is a much closer relationship to be part of God's family. Okay? We, we, we don't become gods. We don't become little gods like the lunatic so, TV preachers claim. But we become adopted children of God, sons of God by adoption in God's family. That's a much closer relationship than a friendship. So absolutely. So being a son, being a daughter is closer friendship than a friend. But can you not be both? No. no. I'm no. friends with my dad. I'm very close with my dad. No. Good friends. God is, God, is, God is not your dad. When God uses the term friend of God, it has a specific meaning. It's used of Old Testament saints who died in their sins, but God was going to redeem them, apply the grace of Christ to them, impute the righteousness of Christ to them, Christ would take their sins unto himself at his resurrection. So in other words, Abraham would be saved at Christ's resurrection. And that's the meaning of friend of God. It's got nothing to do with um, a great crowd who are going to live on an earth having this title of friend of God. Yeah, irrelevant of a hope, irrelevant of where, where your hopes, you know, whether it's a heavenly or earthly hope, there is a prospect of, of proving yourself as a good friend to Jehovah the same way as you prove yourself as a good friend. Jehovah to will reject you. Anyone. No, Jehovah will reject you. He will okay. have nothing to do with you whatsoever. He will not listen to your prayers. He he will ignore you. Beings, Pardon? The most loving being in the universe who's looking for ones to serve him. Surely ones who are approving themselves righteous, doing the best they no. can. No, no, no. Are not prove themselves? No, absolutely not. It's impossible. It's impossible for you to prove yourself um, to Jehovah God. The only thing Jehovah recognises is the work of Jesus Christ. Christ's righteousness imputed to you and your sins imputed to Christ. It's a technical term. It's called double imputation. And if people, who ha people who have experienced that, Christ's righteousness imputed to them, their sins imputed to Christ, they're in the new covenant and they are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who is the seal of that new covenant. I think that's Ephesians 1.13, I think. Without wishing to be too technical, if the Holy Spirit is in you, then the Father and the Son, as well as the Holy Spirit, indwell you. I actually changed the Alpha course because they got that wrong on the Alpha course. And I wrote to Nicky Gumbel, never had an, a, a, never had an acknowledgement from him. But when I looked at the Alpha videos, um, when they revised them, that particular point where he said Christians only have the Holy Spirit inside them, he changed it. He, now, he then said, um, I wish to make it very clear, and he repeated himself, he said it twice, Christians have not just the Holy Spirit, they have the Father and Son and Holy Spirit indwelling them. 2 Corinthians 13.5 is very insistent. We, you can tell if you are a true Christian, or whether you're going to be disqualified. Is that verse again, Robert? Second Corinthians chapter thirteen, verse five. Okay. So keep testing whether you're in the faith, keep proving what you yourselves are. Do you not recognise that Jesus Christ is in union with you unless you are disapproved? If you go to the Kingdom Interlinear translation, the word union is not in the Greek text. It says, do you not know yourselves that Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? That means disqualified as a Christian. So anyone who doesn't have Jesus Christ, 
that doesn't mean the flesh of Jesus Christ it means Christ's divine spirit who is um, the, the Spirit of God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Anyone who doesn't have Christ inside them is disqualified as a Christian. And the fact that a person has the Father, Son and Holy Spirit indwelling them is a sign of the new covenant. It, it's prophesied in John 14, 23. This was another verse that helped me out of the oneness movement because oneness which is a form of modalism teaches that Jesus is the father it teaches the heresy that God is one person uh, who at one time is father another time is son and another time is Holy Spirit so Jesus is the father in, in modalism and John fourteen twenty three, it's speaking prophetically it's speaking prophetically of after Christ's death burial and resurrection talking of Pentecost if anyone loves me he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will first person plural come to him and make our home with him one as Pentecostals teach that God is one person so if God is one person why is this first person plural we will apply to the father and the son used here of the father and the son indwelling us um, so should we should we leave that for another time you want to say anything we, or you want we, to leave we it can do. We're, we're, you know obviously you, you've caught me on a hop here with these these intriguing subjects i think we're a little bit out of practice in two years of not meeting people face to face <laughs> well you so, can uh, make some you can make some notes mick and and get back I'll, to I'll me jot down these scriptures you've referenced there that's very yeah. good I, I am i'm so relieved that you know you, you you the student of the bible you're looking to the bible for the answers i'm so relieved with that so many times we come across ones who just believe in what they've been told tradition practices um yeah as you've as you've disproved many of these so i'm glad you've got an open mind there and uh, okay so so that just just referring to that john 14 23 talk, talking about jehovah's friendship then we're talking about love I mean, what's what's stronger love or friendship uh, love the no family but isn't that the family is family? family is stronger than friendship but not always the case of modern family sadly pardon but that's not always the case of modern families sadly it's often there's not much love in a family but love is is that is that strong bond isn't it so it's, it's the motivating force it's the strongest force we can have so when jehovah's saying there you know he will love you he's he that, he's speaking he's speaking to the apostles he, he's he's speaking to his his apostles here the jesus context said. is jesus speaking to his apostles the high priestly prayer comes uh, later in john 17. jesus is jesus is speaking specifically to the 12 apostles and they would come into the new 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 covenant relationship from the book of acts acts chapter 2 onwards when they were indwelt by the father son and holy spirit so this verse, the context is Jesus is speaking to his apostles. He is indeed. He's yeah, not, he, he's not speaking that. to everyone who's ever lived and saying, everybody who's ever lived on earth will be indwelt by the Father and the Son. He's he not saying say everyone's going to come into the new covenant and everyone's going to be saved. He's, he's not saying that. The yeah, context is the apostles. He hasn't mentioned the covenant there, but he's certainly saying, if anyone loves me, he'll observe my word. Well, that doesn't that apply to everyone. If no, love, no, because love no, because he says, if if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. In other words, he's talking about people being indwelt by the father and the son, and elsewhere passages like um, Romans eight nine, it talks about the Holy Spirit indwelling his people. So. People are going to be indwelt by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, that's not everyone on earth. That's people who are in the New Covenant. So he's specifically talking here about the New Covenant. But that, that point, just the principle, just picking up there, if anyone loves me, he'll observe my word. And my Father will love him. Yeah. I mean, the, why, why does that not apply to anyone who's, who 
who loves Jesus who right. follows command. Right. Right. Let's it's let's let's go. Right. Let's do this. Let's go back to verse sixteen briefly because I, I do want to move on I've got another question and I will pray the father and he will give you another helper right it's a reference to the Holy Spirit that he may abide with you forever the Holy Spirit does not abide does not abide with everyone the Holy Spirit abides with people who are in the new covenant even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot see because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you that's speaking prophetically I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer, the world will see me no more because you see me because I live. You will live also. Uh, when it says you will live also, that's a reference to the new birth. So he's prophetically talking about the new birth. Uh, at that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandment and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you have manifested yourself to us and not to the world? So he's speaking to the apostles. This is Jesus speaking to the apostles and promising them the indwelling Holy Spirit in verse 16. The Father and the Son will indwell them in verse 23. The context is the new birth, the new covenant. People who come into a new covenant relationship. And then the verse itself, Jesus answers and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. And then it goes on in verse 26, But the Helper the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will teach you all things prophetic of the indwelling Holy Spirit from Acts chapter 2 onwards. Could, could we leave that for another time? Yep, okay, that's absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm totally with you on the context there. I'm, I'm struggling to see how this you know, rules out a friendship. Well, you the know, Bible friendship. doesn't say it. Got a friendship with God. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, the Bible teaches that you must wear sacred underwear. You must have sacred underwear, uh, basically large boxer shorts with a compass and a square on them, right? Because that's what the Mormons wear. Now they could talk for hours about this, but there's yes. no verse in the Bible the that Bible. specifically <laughs> says you must wear sacred underwear. It's all inferences and out of context verses. Okay. There's as much proof for being a friend of God as there is for sacred underwear. You you have to show a verse that that says that. So you know, mention. I know you're looking at New Testament, looking for scriptures there, but you know, looking at the Hebrew scriptures, Psalms twenty five fourteen. Talk yeah, about that's a thousand. That's a thousand years before Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. People became friends of God in Psalms twenty five, a thousand BC. But they didn't become friends of God after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. When when Pentecost happened, okay, let let let, let, let I've kept saying Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Let's say Pentecost. From Pentecost what? onwards, no one becomes a friend of God. And if I'm wrong, show me, show me where I'm wrong. Let me let me do some research. Yeah, I think that's probably the best thing. Um, the final thing, and I do have to go, is. Lesson 13 on page 55, How False Religion Misrepresents God, Mick. Okay. 